thank you very much, Barry, for your kind words. I could have gone on listening to you speak for quite a while. I'm grateful for each one of you being here and talking about the, the opportunity to talk about a subject that I dearly love and that I know that you love as well. Although I don't assume that everyone here is a preacher, and I'm going to try and make my remarks um, accessible to everyone, and I'm going to start, first of all, by saying what homiletics is. Uh, I had a colleague who teaches homiletics at Drew University, Charles Rice, and he was doing some guest preaching at a neighboring congregation, and he said, you know, if any of you would ever like to come by our seminary, you're welcome to drop in and, and sit in on w one of my courses in homiletics. And one of the women in the congregation came up to him afterwards and, and said, well, Dr. Rice, I very much appreciate your invitation. And I, I certainly would do it if I was only interested in home ec. <laughs> Homiletics is the art of preaching. And uh, our task tonight, uh, I'm talking about historicizing the fluid text. I'm I'm in the first part, I'm going to be talking about the relationship of exegesis to preaching. And in the latter part, I'm going to be talking about the way in which the text our understanding of the text has changed, and, and uh, this is going to have some new implications for us as preachers. Current homiletical texts have started to spend a fair amount of time on exegesis. And many of the writers in homiletics are producing books short commentaries, books that are exegetical aids for preachers. And part of the question that I ask is, well, you know, there aren't that many homileticians. We are outnumbered by biblical scholars, perhaps 17 to 1. So shouldn't people who are teaching homiletics just concentrate on the homiletical end of the process, on, on the actual formation of the sermon, and leave the, the biblical, exegetical work to people in biblical studies. I, is that a good resource, a good use of our time, if, if we're, we're spending so much time and so much energy looking at the Bible? And tonight I'm wanting to argue that indeed homiletics does need to be concerned with the exegetical end of the process, partly because our understanding within homiletics of our task has changed so radically these past years that homiletics and exegesis are an intimate relationship. Is this microphone picking up all right? Thank you. When I was a student, in the seminary, the book that most instructed me in how to do biblical exegesis was a slim volume published by Seabury Press in 1967. Some of you may have studied it as well. It was Otto Kaiser and Werner Kummel, Exegetical Method, a Student's Handbook. And it was written by two exemplary German biblical scholars, translated into English, and this is what they said of the exegetical process at that time. They said exegesis for them was a scientific process. It was a scientific process. And it involves asking two kinds of questions, one concerning the historical origin of the text, and that included the situation of its hearers and, and uh, and the other was concerning what they called the objective meaning of the text. And that was meaning in the singular. The objective meaning of the text. It was a, it was a scientific process that was 
meant to gain the objective meaning of the text. Any interpretation, they said, violates the text that doesn't get to its historical origin or to its earliest form. The steps that Kummel in particular outlines for introductory New Testament exegesis are perhaps familiar to most preachers and yet they are nonetheless instructive to review just quickly here. First, use a reliable edition of the Greek New Testament and use its critical apparatus to see, just to see if there are some textual problems with it, to see if there are some significant variations amongst the earliest manuscripts. Second, outline the sequence of thought in the specific text with a view to its structure. Some people suggest, well, make an outline of the text. Draw, diagram the, the, the line of, of, of movement within the text. Third, identify key words and phrases that might be thematic clues and check in a lexicon or concordance for the meaning of those terms. Fourth, make a provisional translation in the original language. Fifth, use specialized commentaries. Determine the text's boundaries. Make sure that you're cutting it in the right place, that you aren't excluding something of the original unit. And ask questions like, it, about what is its immediate context? And what larger section of thought does this passage belong to? Six, read a comprehensive commentary about the historical context and prehistory. Seven, determine what the author means to say in the larger work. Eight, check to see if the text has parallels elsewhere or if other texts are cited that might give a clue about the source. Nine, seek the meaning of the text in its oldest attestable form. Uh, certainly when I came through seminary, I had an understanding, I was given an understanding, that if I could get to the earliest form of the biblical text, I was somehow dealing with more reliable scripture, which is not the case. And only then and after all of that process venture an interpretation of the text. Well, since Kaiser and Kummel wrote, the basic means of historical textual investigation has remained largely intact, but attitudes and practices have changed dramatically. And I think it's dangerous to say that scholars agree on anything. But it's safe to say that most scholars now tend to agree that interpretation is an inescapably bias-laden. That is, we come to the text with a particular bias and it's impossible for anyone to enter into an absolutely neutral reading of a text. All texts have what Paul Ricoeur called a surplus of meaning. In other words, they have many meanings, not just one. That search that Kummel identified for the objective meaning in the singular is no longer something that would be affirmed. Even to determine what are authentic or legitimate meanings depends upon points of view. And there is no one single point of view that can be claimed as the right one. Thus, most interpretations today are necessarily tentative or we could use the word fluid. In such a climate, when there are many possible legitimate meanings of a biblical text, it's very easy for the biblical text, to, the meaning of the text to be seen as something that's completely relative. It depends on your own perspective. Anything might go. Texts themselves demonstrate a fluidity and they can mean anything an interpreter wants to claim. <laughs>
In this kind of setting, the authority of Scripture to govern the faith and life of the Church is seriously jeopardized. Relativism is not the only alternative in this fluid situation. Theological claims of the text can still be tested and evaluated. It's just that interpretation needs to be performed now within specific limits. One needs to identify just what perspective one is speaking from. Both culturally and personally. The act of biblical interpretation, once considered a science by Kaiser and Kummel just a few decades ago, has now become an art. As Richard B. Hayes says, because exegesis is an art rather than a science, no single mechanical procedure can be prescribed. One of the, and basically what this means is that, that one might approach one text using the identical pattern that Kummel identified, and we might have to follow a different pattern with another text. One of the most important shifts in recent times concerns three terms, exegesis, hermeneutics, and homiletics. And the distinction between these terms has, has never been absolute. And the root meanings help us to see what the problem is. Exegeomai means to explain or interpret. Thus, exegesis is an explanation or interpretation of the text. And it tends to connote for us an historical approach that determines what the text said for its first hearers. Hermes is the Greek messenger god, and that's where we get the word hermeneutics from. And hermeneutics basically means the art of communicating messages. It, it's also very closely aligned to explanation and interpretation, but it tends to connote something a little different from exegesis, Hermeneutics tends to connote bringing the text's meaning forward to today across all of the cultural, language, and other barriers that exist between the text's time and our own. And it also means bringing, bringing the full weight of today's world to bear on the biblical text. Homiletics. The third of our terms is from homily, which is Greek for to crowd together, such as one might do for a conversation. A homily is often regarded as a conversation, but the word also indicates a certain kind of crowding together in a pewless church, such as the early church would have had, in order to hear the word of God. And to a degree, all three of these terms crowd together in preaching, for the boundaries between them are blurred. Homiletics in the past has tended to connote taking the meaning of the text and applying it to the specific needs of a specific congregation. All three of these terms, exegesis, hermeneutics and homiletics and the actions that they represent traditionally were understood to be like three consecutive buses that a preacher took between the Bible and the sermon in what we might imagine to be Sermon City. Early in the week, preachers used to board the exegesis bus and they would travel up Bible Boulevard through the historical part of town. 
And while they were journeying through the historical part of town, they would do their historical critical work on the biblical text. They would then transfer to the hermeneutics bus for the trip up to the newer end of town, up to Today Street. And on this bus, they would come to understand the significance of the text for today. At Today Street, they would get off the bus and transfer yet to a third bus, the homiletics bus, which would take them from Today Street up to the door of the very church where the sermon was going to be preached. Several things have changed in recent decades. Exegesis is less distinctly a scientific method, and it often becomes a hermeneutical process, varying from text to text. Whereas in earlier decades, access to the text was primarily diachronic, that is, through time, historical in other words, whereas in earlier times this access was primarily diachronic, centered exclusively in historical criticism, now it is also synchronic, which means at the same time. In other words, instead of simply going back into history, we can... We we now affirm, with literary criticism, that we can gain an immediate access to meanings in the text without having the historical understanding of the text. It's not that, that we don't need the historical understandings, but we can nonetheless have a, some kinds of engagement with the text at an immediate level. I don't know why this was a big discovery, because that's what people have been doing all through the centuries. They've been engaging the text at an immediate level, at a synchronic level. But this has come now to be a new understanding for us in the academic field. Literary criticism allows us direct and immediate appreciation of the text through such things as narrative plot, character, emotion, Textual interpretation was formerly thought to stop once the meaning for today was secured. Thus, what a preacher was doing was not textual interpretation per se in the homiletical act. It was applying the interpretation to the contemporary scene. The biblical scholarly task was thought to be complete once textual interpretation was finished and the baton was handed over to the preacher to carry the sermon to the finish line. There's been a shift, however, and now interpretation is not so easily confined. It continues throughout sermon composition as a preacher represents the text or represents the text within the sermon. You know, I think one of our big mistakes as, as preachers, certainly as, as preachers when we first go out, is that we know that the text has been read in the service. And so we feel that we are safe, once we get to the sermon, to comment upon the text. But in fact, people haven't really heard the text, even though it has been read. I know that I myself have to struggle in church. I hear what the reading's going to be. I hear the beginning of the reading and I say, oh, it's that reading? And unless I concentrate on actual hearing of it, I will find that I have drifted and I haven't heard it. The fact of the matter is that when we preach, we have to reconstruct the text for our hearers before we can actually add commentary about it. We have to give it to them once again so they can be fully with us. Interpretation now continues throughout the sermon process. As a preacher presents the text, 
and even in the pulpit where further adjustments are being made during delivery. In other words, as preachers, we have no interpretation of the text until we have the sermon. It's not that the, the, we have an interpretation at this stage and now we have a sermon. It's rather the sermon is the interpretation. We don't have another interpretation other than the sermon. The interpretation task continues from the beginning of the biblical process to the end of sermon delivery. Moreover, before, preachers were instructed not to engage a text in personal ways until its singular meaning had been determined. And now preachers are to engage the text in both scholarly and personal ways as a means of discovering what the text is actually saying. We can't leave ourselves out of the process. It's not just that we have a bias, that we have to be careful of intruding on the text. Now we also have to engage the text personally to discern the fullness of meaning that it has to offer. There are yet more exegetical changes to identify. Preachers used to be encouraged to spend most of the week doing historical critical work with the text. My time up? <laughs> and I left seminary with the understanding, and I, I don't know if if the same was your experience as well. And I, I, I don't know that the professors ever intended this to be taught, but the understanding that I went away with was that if I did good historical critical exegesis, if I spent most of my week reading the commentaries and doing the work with the Bible and reading widely, that I was 80% of the way into the pulpit. That's the understanding I left seminary with. And Truth be told, that's how I first organized my weeks when I was, first went out into the pastoral field. I'd spent 80% of my study time working with the biblical text and reading widely. And then I would allow myself 20% of the time, in other words, start on Friday or Saturday, to write the sermon. A preacher is relatively safe, and I was relatively safe, all that time that I was working on the 80%. Because I wasn't having to risk anything. Preachers have to risk once they start engaging the biblical text with today. And they have to risk because it's no longer safe territory. As, as long as we're dealing with back then and, and with history, we can have a fair degree of confidence. We've got lots of biblical scholars to help us. But when it comes to the task of bringing this text to bear on, on, on the life of the, the woman who has cancer, uh, the child who, who is on drugs, uh, the man who has just lost his wife, when we come to bring the text home so that Jesus Christ speaks to the individual, then we have to be in risky territory. It's a little bit like moving from outer space to in, into, into re-entry. It, it's, it's like what uh, Walter Brueggemann says, even in writing a commentary designed for preachers, he expresses some of his own dis-ease about talking about the now. And, and it, it almost sounds like that re-entry process, and there's that turbulence that, that we know so tragically hit the Columbia. This is what Walter Brueggemann says, the farther one moves, moves away from then, way out there, toward now, down here on the earth, the more the risks increase. On the one hand, that is because we have no methodological consensus about how to move from then to now. Or even if it is legitimate to make the move. On the other hand, the move very much depends on the individual's judgment about the needs and prospects of the present situation, a judgment inevitably personal, he says. Well, I am no less committed than I once was to the necessity, the absolute necessity, 
of us doing careful, historical, critical, exegetical work for preparation for preaching. We had a conversation uh, over supper tonight, and, and um, it, it was one of the, uh, a new insight to me that Glenn gave me was that sometimes a commentary like the interpreter's Bible has, has the exegetical portion in one place and the interpretation of how we're to use it for preaching in another. And because there's a vast distance between the two, in other words, how it's to be used for the congregation seems to have no bearing on the exegetical comments. It's that kind of commentary, it was pointed out to me, that, that encourages us to think that, well, we can dispense with the exegesis because it isn't necessary for the preaching. And what we need to be doing is understanding that it's only through the historical critical work that we can begin to do the necessary theologizing on the text, which we'll be talking about tomorrow, that renders the text as scripture for the church. So while I think that historical critical exegesis is absolutely essential, I now think that the total percentage of time that a preacher can devote to historicizing the text, as I'm calling exegesis, is much lower. Perhaps about 30% of the total time for sermon preparation. So much else needs attention by way of literary, theological, and congregational interpretation in sermon composition. Further, historicizing a text is not a process that finishes when the sermon, before the sermon is done. It continues into the sermon as the preacher strives to represent the text in historically responsible ways within the sermon. That too is exegetical work. My own suggestion is that we begin to do our sermon composition early in the week, Monday or Tuesday. And I spread it through to the end of the week, allowing a set amount of time each day. And I know that in a busy parish situation that may seem like an unrealistic proposition. And yet if we don't guard our sermon time, we're failing to be responsible to the gospel. And we aren't honoring our own congregations. We need to have a set amount of time that is just ours for study. However much time that is, we, we have to be careful with it. We can't take too much and we can't take too little. But if we spend a little time each day, a couple of hours each day, working on our sermon, it is worth far more than the same number of hours crammed into Saturday. I don't know about you, but I do a lot of my creative work when I'm sleeping. <coughs> when I look out and I'm preaching and if I see someone sleeping, I figure, well, that's a creative exercise. <laughs> They're working out a theological problem. And they're probably coming up with a better answer than I. When I go into the library at my college and I see some students sleeping on the library desk, I think, oh, now there's a hard-working student working through a difficult problem. When we sleep, we do a lot of our best creative thinking. And if we cram all of our sermon work, exegesis, hermeneutics, homiletics, if we cram it all into one day we deprive the Holy Spirit of opportunity of working with us and transforming our understanding, transforming ourselves during the week. Some of our students are very keen on, on spiritual formation, and they, because I'm in the Toronto School of Theology, many of them go over to the Roman Catholic colleges for spiritual formation. And they just don't understand. I try and tell them, that's not our tradition. Our tradition of spiritual formation is sermon preparation, wrestling with the biblical text, praying over the text, trying to discern what Christ is wanting to say to the community this week. That's our spiritual formation. 
Moreover, nowadays, it's also understood that right from the first minute of our engagement with the biblical text, the congregation is still present. In fact, Fred Craddock, who's one of the preeminent teachers of preaching of our time, recommended that before you do anything with the biblical text, he says, the first thing you should do is read the text aloud. And he's wanting the text to be read aloud with the congregation in mind. In other words, not keeping the congregation at bay while the whole exegesis process is, is done. And then introduce them later on in the homiletical work. Do it early on. Further, much is, is lost in the old way of devoting most of the week to reading and note-taking and waiting until the end of the week to start drawing one's notes together. Working, working from notes can be a little bit like trying to make tea from a used tea bag. When, when you read a book, your experience may be the same as mine. You get energy from the ideas. And if you channel that energy that's ultimately going to be communicated in the sermon, if you channel that energy into little notes that you're going to gather at the end of the week, you lose a lot of the energy. You come on Friday and you look at that note that you made on Monday and you say, well, why did I write that? Why was I excited about that idea? In fact, what would be far better is what I encourage my doctoral students to do. Don't do all of your research and then plan to write your, write your dissertation. Write your dissertation while you're doing your research. Instead of making notes, write a paragraph. Write a paragraph that might be suitable for your dissertation. It's true, you can revise it in any way you want afterwards, but you're far further ahead and you've captured the energy for the form in which you want to proclaim it. So if I were looking for a model that might suit the exegetical hermeneutical process for preaching, it wouldn't be the model of the preacher taking three successive buses in Sermon City. Rather, I would conceive of a single bus filled with folks who are huddled in the darkness <laughs> in conversation. And there, there are three different groupings of these, uh, of, of these people on the bus. Three different conversations are going on on the same bus. At the back of the bus, perhaps, there's a group that's working on, on exegetical matters, having to do precisely with the shape and form of the text and, and, and the important words and key themes. A and there's another group that's doing hermeneutical matters, wondering how this, this actually connects to today. And there's another group that's already working on the sermon, writing it out. But these three groups are not entirely separate. That is, individuals flow from one to the other, and, and the boundaries between the groups change because one person turns one direction, they're in one conversation, turns in another. And the preacher is moving up and down the aisle. And these three activities are, are in a sense, parallel activities that happen simultaneously we can still be responsible to the Bible and responsible to the exegetical process if we think of three separate kinds of tracks that we're working on. And at times we are being, being responsible as scholars. At other times we're being responsible as pastors. At other times we're being responsible as hermeneutes, bringing the meaning forward or bringing the world to bear on the text. So it's three activities, three parallel activities that are happening at the same time as the bus makes its way along Bible Boulevard and to Day Street and goes all the way, the same bus, goes all the way from the biblical text right up to the doors of the church. The weekly route is the same, but each journey is different because the texts change and the conversation partners they change, too, different people on the bus. So in this analysis, homiletics shifts from being third in a sequence to being one element of a threefold 
parallel activity. Exegesis, hermeneutics, and homiletics. I now want to turn and uh, discuss the change that has been made to the biblical text. Because the text itself has become fluid. If one homiletics book was more pivotal than it, any other in making the text something of a fluid process, undermining the traditional sequence of exegesis, hermeneutics, homiletics, it was a book by Don Wardlaw, edited by Don Wardlaw, called Preaching Biblically, Creating Sermons in the Shape of Scripture. came out in 1983. And different contributors to this volume suggested ways in which the sermon apparently could be shaped, ways that hadn't been thought of before. Ron Allen suggested it could be according to the language of the biblical text. Don Wardlaw suggested it would be by the context of the text. Charles Rice said it was the interplay of the text and its images. And Tom Long said it was the encounter of the text with the preacher. Tom Long went on to develop this idea in preaching the literary forms of the Bible. And in that book he's saying that biblical texts have a certain rhetorical structure. They're intended to persuade the audience. They, they, they develop a, a way of persuasion and if what our preaching should do is try and capture one aspect of that persuasive development. Now, if he had been, in some ways, his claim was a revolutionary claim. It was kind of like the first footstep on the moon in homiletics. And if he had been a, something less of a theorist, he's a superb theorist, if he had been a lesser theorist, he might have been bouncing around in lesser gravity and saying that, well, if you're preaching a letter, one of Paul's letters, your sermon should be in the shape of a letter. Or if you're preaching a psalm, your sermon should be a psalm. He wasn't saying that. He was just saying that one aspect of the rhetorical, persuasive character of the sermon can give us the direction for the sermon shape. What all of these speakers were doing is they were recognizing that the shape of the sermon, something, something happens when we're working with the text. And there's a creative energy that happens when we can actually feel the text move from then to now beneath our fingers. As we experience that shift taking place, we feel the sermon starting to emerge and, and there's something about that experience that is going to be communicated through the sermon. All of this implies a rhetorical and performative dimension of texts and a greater degree of interaction with them on the part of readers and ultimately a different vision of the biblical text itself in the homiletical process. When historical critical exegesis was a preacher's almost exclusive entryway to a biblical text, we treated the text as if it was a, well, it was kind of like a fragment of pottery that we picked up in an archaeological dig. And one didn't just pick it up, one first of all photographed it and, and tried to get, measure how deep it was in the soil and determine at what layer it was. We photographed it in the dirt. And only after it had been clearly measured and marked and examined, then we used every laboratory technique that we could to extract its information. For all that a text might tell us, it was nonetheless, in this former way of understanding a text, it was an object, an inert thing, like a piece of pottery something that passively received the scientific tests that we gave it. And ultimately, it yielded its objective meaning. That image is no longer adequate. 
because as we have seen, our methods have expanded to include literary and other approaches to the text. Our science is more appropriately now considered an art, and all of our readings include some measure of subjectivity. As preachers, we are not intended to engage the Bible with rubber gloves. We are not... We, every time we touch a biblical text, we leave our fingerprints indelibly upon it. And while we might think that our purpose should be to be more objective, that isn't what God intended. God did not shy away from becoming human. God intended our, even our fleshness to be part of the medium through which the Word of God is communicated. It's partly our engagement with the text that renders the Word as the Word because the Word is not the dead Word on the page, it is the live Word that the Holy Spirit inspires in and through the reading of Scripture in informed ways that draw upon our tradition. The text is always changing, depending upon the angle from which we look at it. And every time we read it, we affect how it appears, how it changes. And in this regard, reading a text is very much like going to a pool. Think of the text as a pool of meanings, like a pool of water. And as soon as you dip your hand into it, you affect it. Ripples go across the, acro across the surface. Now we appreciate also the tremendous fluid energy within the text that's waiting to be released. And the energy that exists between this text and that other text over here that sounds a little bit like it. It's got an echo of it. There's a similar image. Jesus said a similar thing. Uh, it, this was foretold in the Old Testament. All of those kinds of intertestamental linkings, intertextual meanings. Though different interpretative activities are still implied, the boundaries between them all are increasingly blurred, and an individual act of interpretation is no longer considered to be the end product, but rather it's a process. The meaning that we have is a process. It's, it's the meaning that we have at this particular moment, like the light coming on. <laughs> and then the light goes off, and we're somewhere else. It, the meaning that we have for preaching is rather like a, a splash of water photographed in the air. It's there for the moment, and it is gone the next time you go to it. <laughs> Thank you, God. It, it's that kind of, of uh, lively engagement with the word. The, it's, it's a fluid word that we're talking about here. What does this fluidity of the text imply for the authority of Scripture? Well, our view of the authority of Scripture is not a literalist one that takes all biblical texts to be of equal value, nor is it the fundamentalist one that insists on certain fixed ideas as absolute interpretive keys, but it is one, rather, that affirms God's authority residing in the Word, the necessity of the Holy Spirit to illuminate it, and the authority of the church in affirming Scripture as the book by which it measures and guides its life. It's my understanding that we need to undergo a paradigm shift to put God at the center of Scripture. And this may be a paradigm shift that you need less than we do, for instance, in my own school, which has placed so much emphasis on historical critical approach to, to texts, often to the expense of leaving faith out. But we need to put God at the center of Scripture. I like to make a distinction between the Bible and Scripture. The Bible can be read by anyone. 
and people can draw whatever meanings they wish from it. Uh, it can be read in a literature class in university, uh, and it's quite appropriate to question many of its, the assumptions that we wouldn't question necessarily in the church. But when we speak about scripture, we're talking about the Bible as revelation. And when we talk about the Bible as revelation, we're talking about God and God's relationship with humanity. It's very easy for us to read a biblical text, particularly in this cultural milieu and theological milieu that comes through many of our commentaries. It's easy for us to read the biblical text as though it's just about humanity or as though we can just tell this biblical story over again and that's our, our task for preaching. And many preachers never get to God and what's worse is they don't realize that they never got to God or that they should have got to God. Because that's the purpose of Scripture. Well, the implications of a fluid text. Just a, a few very quick ones, and then I'm going to close. Um, first of all, because the text has this fluid nature, we are, I think, increasingly required to be able to deal with the text in narrative ways that honor that fluidity. So we have increasingly an emphasis on narrative preaching. But narrative preaching has been widely mal maligned as simply storytelling. It can't be simply storytelling. Narrative is every bit as complex as the most intricate of logical arguments. There's a logic inherent in narrative. And the theological requirement of narrative is every bit as present as the theological requirement for prose other forms of prose. So we need to keep on working on narrative in preaching. I'm not going to say very much about that one, or, nor the intertextual connections, which I think also are important for us to hold up as an implication of the fluid nature of the text. When a bi biblical scholar, when we're in a, a Bible class, if I'm teaching the Bible, I'm going to teach that a biblical text is of certain pericope. It's a, it's a unit of thought. It's, it's got its own boundaries. And I'll discuss in that class what those boundaries are. I think that the time has, has shifted so that when those of us in homiletics talk about the text for the sermon, we need to question whether that definition of text is sufficiently adequate. Is the text, the text that we are preaching, as though our purpose is to proclaim the particular pericope? Or is the text that we preach in a sermon not just the pericope that we are lifting up, the unit of scripture, it's not just that, but it's that and every link we make to any part of the story, the gospel story, indeed, the link that we make to the cross. The text that we are preaching is the entire Bible. It's the gospel that we are proclaiming. The purpose is not one particular pericope. It's that pericope's connection to the larger faith story. So I'm wondering whether the the text, our understanding of text is adequate in that regard. So we need to be thinking not just of narrative, of a preaching narrative and its relationship to this fluid text, but also of the intertextual connections. And finally, uh, by way of a more practical example, I want to be suggesting that there can be in our own preaching a, more of a bleeding than there has been between then and now, between the Bible and the present day. And let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. 
from Mark 10, 17, the story of the rich young man who comes to Jesus. And I don't know how you see him in Mark's version. But when I think of the rich young man, I think it could be someone probably in his 20s, could be a youth pastor, a wealthy youth pastor, <laughs> a, a, a youth pastor who drives a BMW, a black BMW with black tinted windows and, and low profile tires, you know those tires that are only about this high, and the suspension is, is especially low slung down, low to the ground, low riding BMW, and, and he's, he doesn't have room in his trunk for any suitcases because his trunk is filled up with amplifiers and speakers. <laughs> and, and this youth pastor hears that Jesus is, is preaching over in the next town, not far from that. So he jumps in his BMW and he's got the, the Christian CDs going and he's flaring down the dusty road to where Jesus is. Jesus and his disciples, they're just packing up at, at the moment that, that uh, the young man is approaching. They can hear him coming before they see him. And then the, the, there's this roar coming from the, the horizon, and, and the, they hear the da dum da dum da dum of the radio blasting across the countryside. And the ma young man comes up in his BMW and screeches to a, a stop in front of Jesus, huge cloud of dust. And for a moment, there is perfect silence when he turns off the ignition. And only gradually is there the return of the sound of birds, children playing off in the field. And he opens his door, and he's got the Oakley sunglasses and the Tommy Hilfiger shorts. And he comes over to Jesus, and he says, Oh, Jesus, it's way cool that we're here together. It, it, is, it, is so, it is so amazing that you are here. Uh, tell me, tell me, I, I just had to come and see you. Tell me what I must do in order that I might inherit the kingdom of God. He says, I, I do all those things that you, you know, I do not commit murder, I, I don't commit adultery, I do not steal, I honor my mother and my father, I do not bear false witness, I don't cheat. What must I do in order to inherit your kingdom? And he thinks, he thinks it's going to be something really small. Just a little tweaking here or there. He, he knows it because he knows that his own life, well, it isn't completely fulfilled. There's something that's missing, but it isn't, can't be much. He knows that he's good. And Jesus looks at him. He loves him. He loves him. He, he, he doesn't love him for what he could be, what he might be, what he will be. He loves him right now for who he is. And he says to him, this one thing must you do. Take your BMW and sell it in Auto Trader, and take your Christian CDs and, and, and give them away to somebody. Uh, sell your fancy clothes. Come, sell everything that you have. Come and follow me. And rich will be your reward in heaven. Well, we all know the story. And the young man looks at Jesus and some versions suggest that he was broken hearted. That he was broken hearted. And he got into his car, and this time he did not turn on the CD. And he drives away over the hill, and the dust cloud that he makes is the last we ever see of him in the New Testament. Now tomorrow I want to be saying that that isn't the end of his story. But for tonight, 
We'll leave him going over the horizon, and he's headed toward Heartbreak Hotel, <laughs> the place of all broken promises, the place where curtain music plays 24 hours a day. <laughs> now, I gather there's time for some questions. In typical Baptist fashion, you have seated yourselves <coughs> near the back and away from the microphone. If you speak up, we'll all be able to hear your question. Those of you who'd like to come and address them to the microphone as you put them to Paul are most welcome to do so. We'll have about 12 minutes for questions, and then we'll enjoy a reception together in the foyer where you can greet our speaker more personally. Yes, Mark. That's a really good question, and I was, certainly wasn't meaning to dismiss the whole endeavor of, of um, finding other ways of, of approaching our own spirituality. <coughs> but I do think that we, all, of, all seminaries struggle with the question of spiritual formation for students. And, uh,